Next high, it's 10 o'clock. CBS News. An autopsy required by Texas law was performed on the body of Howard Hughes in Houston Monday night, but there's still no definite word on what caused his death. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting on the CBS radio network. Hughes, one of the world's wealthiest and most secretive men, died about a half hour before the charter jet carrying him to Houston for hospital treatment was scheduled to land. Airport officials say they had been told to prepare to receive a patient in a diabetic coma, but one of Hughes' longtime attorneys, Greg Boutzer of Los Angeles, says his information is different. I have been informed that he was flying from Acapulco to uh, Houston, and... Uh... Uh, in in flight, uh, he suffered a stroke. I'm informed that uh, uh, he uh, had uh, some illness in which uh, his doctors felt it would probably be best if he came to the Houston Medical Facility for uh, tests and observation, and that was the reason for his flight. The crew of the aircraft says Hughes, in death, appeared emaciated, wasted, looked like a tired, worn-out old person. He was 70 years old. President Ford reaffirms a policy of friendship with Greece. That story and more when CBS News continues. Okay, I made a mistake. My first mistake. But they say guys like me coming out of jail usually wind up coming right back. I like sitting in the park, but not every day. I want to do something useful. People around here, though, I think you're over 65... You're useless. The man crossed him. And... Shoot. Who are you kidding, girl? You're nowhere unless you can read. Tough problems call for real solutions, not just talk. If your community has a problem, you need action. Action is skilled volunteers of all ages working together to help solve tough community problems. Write Action, Department Q, Washington, D.C., 20525. Between us, there's got to be a solution. This is a public service of this station and the Advertising Council. President Ford did not mention the Greek-Turkish dispute over Cyprus, but he did reaffirm a policy of friendship with Greece when he spoke to a banquet of an American Greek society in Washington Monday night. As president, my policy towards Greece is a policy of positive action based on the many interests we share bilaterally, on our important ties as allies, and on the very great ties of friendship and kinship between our peoples. This is my policy. This will continue to be my policy, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to reaffirm it here tonight. Mr. Ford had nothing to say to the American Greek Society audience about the new American Defense Pact with Turkey signed late last month. Primary campaigning is all but over in Wisconsin and New York, where voters go to the polls Tuesday for primary balloting. New Yorkers will vote by party affiliation, but there's open balloting in Wisconsin. That is, any voter may vote for a candidate from any party. Thus, Democrat Mars Udall thinks the independent voters of Wisconsin will provide him with a victory margin there. But Jimmy Carter is also predicting a Wisconsin win. Henry Jackson spent Monday stumping New York, where he is favored, with time out for a side trip to Washington to woo the support of construction union leaders meeting there. A 22-year-old American boxer, Chuck Wilburn of Cleveland, has died in a hospital in Sydney, Australia, four days after being knocked out in a fight. He had undergone emergency surgery for a brain hemorrhage Friday morning, but never regained consciousness. No progress reported from the renewed negotiations in San Francisco, trying to end the strike by some municipal workers, which has crippled transportation in the city. The snarl spread to school buses on Monday when drivers refused to cross picket lines set up by the strikers. We'll have more CBS News after this message. I'm George Herman, CBS News. On Tuesday, the voters go to the polls in two important primary elections. New York, where the delegates are elected by registered party voters, and Wisconsin, an open election state where no party registration is required. Tuesday night, Neil Strausser and I will anchor the results, trends, and highlights of both primaries in special reports, regular newscasts, and net alert bulletins. Tuesday, follow the primaries with CBS News on this CBS Radio Network station. I'm Jim Kelly, CBS Radio Sports, and this Thursday we'll begin coverage of the 38th Masters Golf Tournament live from Augusta, Georgia. Jack Nicklaus trying to win his sixth green jacket, but you can never tell what'll happen when you get a group of great golfers together at Augusta. We'll have special reports beginning Thursday 
60 plus extra coverage Saturday and Sunday, along with reports, of course, in our regularly scheduled CBS Sports broadcast. Listen for special CBS Sports coverage of the 38th Masters beginning Thursday, right here on most of these CBS radio network stations. The British may now be assured that a full complement of U.S. legislators will be in their country to pick up an original copy of the Magna Carta for use in the U.S. bicentennial celebration. The Magna Carta, considered a cornerstone document of constitutional government, was offered by the British if 25 senators and representatives would come get it. Sensitive to complaints about congressional junkets, the lawmakers voted to reduce the size of the delegation to nine. But Monday, after a harsh scolding by, by Majority Leader Mike Mansfield that they were making fools of themselves, the senators returned the delegation to its original size by a voice vote. I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News. CBS 4 Seattle, this is KIXI, the weather outlook. Considerable cloudiness through Wednesday with a few showers at times. Partial clearing tomorrow afternoon. The highs in the mid-50s and lows in the mid-40s. And currently in downtown Seattle, it's 50 degrees, 46 at the airport. The barometer rising, it reads 29.81. And taking a look at sports, New York Mets pitching ace, Tom Seaver has ended his bitter holdout by agreeing to a three-year contract. The Mets say the contract will make Seaver the highest-paid pitcher in baseball history. In the National Basketball Association this evening, Washington beat Atlanta... 133 to 105. It was Milwaukee over Chicago, 102 to 97. And Philadelphia dumped Houston in overtime, 130 to 129. One game in the ABA, the New York Nets down to San Antonio, 104 to 102. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater is next on KIXI. It's now 7 past 10. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Time. That great mystery of time, the silent, never-resting thing called time, rolling, rushing on, swift, like an all-embracing ocean tide, on which we and all the universe swim, like apparitions, which are, and then are not. That's how Thomas Carlyle thought of the miracle of time. But there are people today who think of time a little differently. They see it as something without a beginning and without an end. The whole block is just one big excavation, a big hole in the ground. Read that sign up there, Professor. The buildings formerly at this location have been demolished in order to make room for what will be known as the showplace of the nation, Radio City Music Hall. Radio City was built over 40 years ago. What's that? The good old 6th Avenue L. They tore that down back in 1938. There is no L. There hasn't been one in over 35 years. They tore it down and sold it for scrap. Professor, I think you need a little help. Maybe I do. But if what I think has happened has really happened, then I'm either the luckiest man in the world or the most miserable. mystery drama, Time Killer, was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by all state insurance companies and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. To the man who bought the Skyhawk, to the girl in the century, we're glad you like your Buicks, glad you set your spirit free. And to the family from Ohio, to the folks up in St. Paul, nice to see you join us, nice to see you all. 
That Buick Century of yours is some car. Thanks. We like it. Yeah, and that tie you have on is really nice. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I see you have the V6 engine. Look at all that room. Uh-huh. Isn't that something? Uh-huh. I'll tell you something else. It's something. Over 250,000 people have already bought 1976 Buicks. Re I bet they're really nice people. Do, do you think they'd like to come over for dinner? All 250,000 of them? Well, well, I suppose we'd have to borrow some folding chairs. Yeah, wait a minute. Your mother has a car. Buick, dedicated to the free spirit in just about everyone. Hi, this is Tony Marvin for the National Leukemia Association. Please remember this name, Project Research. In addition to our other services, which are supported separately, Project Research has been established to deliver that knockout punch against leukemia. I can also tell you that every dollar donated to Project Research will help support a doctor or researcher in the leukemia field. Join me and get on a winning team, because it is only through research that a breakthrough can be made. Throw your knockout punch against leukemia. Send your tax-deductible donation today to Project Research, care of the National Leukemia Association, Box 3039, Garden City, New York. That's Box 3039, Garden City, New York. Our thanks to you for Project Research. We are committed to conquering leukemia. Do you recall the ancient story of King Canute? who, in order to demonstrate his absolute power, commanded the ocean tides to stop. But the waves kept breaking relentlessly. Time and tide, he learned, wait for no man, not even a king. But is it conceivable that man, by force of some strange inner power, may one day be able to conquer both the tides and time? It started one day last year in December, just before the Christmas holidays. Professor Edwin Quaylen was giving his end-of-the-semester lecture at the university in his course in parapsychology. The point, ladies and gentlemen, is that time can be just as elastic as space. If, for example, you were in space, hovering over the surface of the Earth in some kind of huge helicopter and the earth kept revolving beneath you, you could choose to land almost at random at any point on that surface. Now, in the same way, every period of time that ever was, that is, or for all we know ever will be, is out there someplace, just waiting for us to put ourselves into it. Well, how do you suppose that'll happen, Professor Quaylen? Some man or woman gifted with special, extraordinary sensibilities might even be someone in this very room will somehow, someday, puncture a tiny hole in the wall of what up to now has been the impenetrable barrier to our physical and psychic senses. When that happens, and the time is near, the human race as we know it will be forever released from the bondage and fog-bound limitation of its own feeble making. All right, thank you. And, uh... Whether you're leaving New York City or staying right here, I want to wish all of you a very pleasant holiday and a happy new year. Professor Kylan, if you have a moment, I'd like to ask a question. Oh, certainly, Clovis. Uh, Miss Mason, I hope I can answer it. Well, I'm almost positive you can. I'm practically starved. How soon do we eat? As soon as the rest of the class clears out. Oh, I am really looking forward to these next few days with my favorite teacher, Professor Quaylen. No more than I with my favorite graduate student, Clovis Mason. we have to do is beat Princeton tomorrow, and that'll put us even in the league with Columbia. Well, what are the chances, Tubby? <laughs> Pretty good. If you don't mind my saying so, Tubby, aren't you up a little late with a game on tomorrow night? Oh, you're right, Professor. I lost track of the time. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me over to your table, Clovis. I hope I didn't interrupt some heavy discussion on uh, time or space. <laughs> Not at all, Tubby. Yeah, nice talking to you, Professor. Yes, uh, good luck. 
The body beautiful, the brain non-existent. That wasn't very nice of you, practically asking him to leave. It wasn't very nice of you. We're very discreet, for that matter, asking him over to our table. Oh, what harm is there? Anyway, what do you care? Well, I wouldn't like you to cost me my job. <laughs> You're really scared I might? Well, you know how I feel about being so much older than you. And besides, I always get a little edgy and tense in a place like this. Ed, why don't you just relax? I do try, you know that. You keep telling me all the time about the self-discipline you learned in those 12 years you spent in the Himalayas. Where was it? Nepal? You know, 98% of the time you're wonderful. Thank you. When you want to be, you can be the calmest, easiest, most charming man in the world. And such fun to be with. And the other 2%? Well, like now, nervous, irrational, and sometimes a little scary. But you're improving every day. Well, I thank you, ma'am. You know, sometimes I think it's a shame that we didn't keep prohibition. Prohibition? <laughs> What's that got I to get... do with it? What's the word? I get so uptight in places like this. I mean, in the old days, way before you were born... Actually, I was hardly more than a kid myself. There used to be wonderful little places, speakeasies. Where two people like you and me could go for a good dinner and a quiet, relaxed evening together and no noisy kids barging in on you. And discreet? Very. I'll bet you'd like nothing better than to turn up in one of those joints, if that were still possible. It is possible. And they were not joints. As a matter of fact, maybe that's where I should have taken you tonight. You know, there are still one or two of them around. They keep up the appearance of how they used to be. Well, why didn't we go to one of them? I never really want to see the inside of one again. Ever. Really? At the same time, I... I have mixed feelings. Because I'd give almost anything if in some way I could follow up what once happened in one of them. A long time ago. Follow up? I've never told you about it for a very good reason. You see, one night... I met this character and... Things began to happen. Before I had the chance to find out what was really going on, I... I ran out on the whole thing. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, forget it. It's too long a story. But if I could ever... Ed, this um, theory of time that you believe in so deeply, just suppose in some way you could prove it actually worked. Well, you know that someday it will. Uh, of course. And suppose... Suppose that I was the one who would prove my own theory correct? That a person of particular sensitivity could more or less pick his own period of time? And as well as place? And deliberately project himself into it? Why not? Why not? Why not indeed? And when I do, I tell you that... Ed, put that glass down. You'll break it. Oh, what have you done? You've broken the wine glass right in your hand. It's the strangest coincidence. Coincidence? Oh, you're bleeding. Here, let me tie my napkin around your fingers. Oh, waiter. Waiter. Uh, is there anything I can do, Colby? Oh, Toby. Uh, um, he's had a little accident. Have you, have you got your car here? Oh, sure thing. Oh, uh, could you, would you give us a lift to his apartment? Well, of course. Get out of here, the two of you. What? Leave me alone. Bed. I want to be alone. I'll take care of everything myself. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. Clovis and Tubby left. I got up to leave. With no warning, I suddenly felt very dizzy. I found it hard to breathe. The whole restaurant started turning around me like a, like a huge spinning top. Somebody loosened my tie, gave me a drink of water. The next thing I knew, I was walking up Fifth Avenue somewhere in the 50s. Without thinking, I automatically turned west into 52nd Street. In minutes, I was standing in front of a darkened door, ringing a bell. I was at Luigi's. It had always been one of my favorite hangouts back in the old days. A peephole in the door opened and I appeared. The Pe peephole closed. There was a pause. The door opened. Well, evening, Mr. Quaylen. Ain't seen you in some time. Well, I, I've been a little busy. Good crowd tonight? Oh, can't complain. Why the peephole? Can't be too careful, Mr. Quaylen. Yeah, you know that? Not these days. Hey, make yourself at home. Uh, anybody sitting here? Oh, yours, brother. Help yourself. Uh, what'll it be, Mr. Quaylen? The regular? Yeah, please. Vodka and tonic. What'd you say? Vodka and, and, and what? Vodka and tonic. Was that something new? Some, some kind of a... <laughs> a Russian drink? 
What's the gag, Luigi? Gag? There's nothing, only, only... Your regular is an orange blossom. Sometimes you switch to a Bronx cocktail. Orange but, blossom? But... Oh. Yes, of course. Uh, bring me an orange blossom. Make mine another Bronx cocktail, please. Okay if this one's on me? I, uh, yes, I, I suppose so. Thank you. You just visiting our fair city? No, no, I'm, uh, I'm born and bred New Yorker. Right here in Fun City. Fun City? <laughs> oh, that's a peak. I got to remember that. How about you? <laughs> well, I've been here three years in the advertising game. Name's Joe Delaney. Ed Quaylen. Glad to know you. What's your racket? Racket? I'm a college professor. Oh, come here often? Well, not as much as I used to. A lot of my drinking pals have died off. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I used to be able to walk in here, meet three or four buddies, have a quiet drink. No arguments about should we stay in the U.N., should we leave the U.N. U.N.? The United Nations. You mean the League of Nations? No, no, I'm talking about the United Nations, Delaney, not the League of Nations. I hear your drinks, gentlemen. Luigi's stuff is the best right off the boat. Off the boat? The liquor, I... I think he brings it in through Canada. That's very funny, Delaney. What's that? Well, you hardly seem old enough to have been around in the old days, and yet the way you talk, the phrases you use... I don't know. I, I really don't know. Something funny seemed to be going on. I had the feeling of having seen all this before, even though it was all happening for the very first time. <laughs> Where'd you find that? It's a real, real collector's item. Find what? A pack of cigarettes. I haven't seen one of those since... Well, you remember, you know, with the war. The war? All the green packs of that brand, like the one you have there, were almost overnight put into white packs and the war started. They were? Sure. And they'll never write tunes like those old ones to me. Most of this new stuff is just so much noise. You can't even get a seat to the show that one comes from three months in advance. Why, you mean they've revived it? Revived it? With such a hit, they've got the nerve to ask four forty for an orchestra ticket. Four forty, really? Uh, things are kind of dead here. Uh, what do you say we toddle over to the Casablanca? I haven't been there in ages. Where is it? You don't know the Casablanca? Was it downtown? No, right over on Sixth Avenue, under the L, number twelve seventy, one flight up. The L. Come on, Ed. I think we can both use a little air. Uh, watch the damage, Luigi. Uh, here's a bad news, Mr. Delaney. Okay, here. Delaney, uh, you don't mind if I call you Joe. No, no, no. I hope you won't be offended if I tell you that some of the expressions you've been using are a little puzzling to me, a little peculiar. How so? Well, things like the advertising game. I haven't heard that in years. What's the damage? Toddle over to the Casablanca. I haven't heard anyone talk like that, and I can't remember. Well, now that you mention it, there are a couple of things you've been saying I find a little odd. No offense, of course. Like that first drink you ordered, uh, what was it? Uh, vodka and what? Tonic. Fun City? United Nations? The war? The war has been over since 1918. Here's your change, Mr. Delaney. Oh, Wait a minute, I don't believe yeah. it. Where did you get those bills, Luigi? I robbed a bank. Where do you think I got them? Where I get all of them, Mr. Quaylen, from customers like you. But the government withdrew those large-sized bills back in 1928. That's when they put out the smaller ones. Like these. That's absolutely amazing. Well, what are they, anyway? Counterfeits? You ever see these little bills, Mr. Delaney? Is this another gag, Ed? Like trying to make us think you couldn't remember what kind of a drink an orange blossom is? What is this, Ed? That's what I intend to find out. Who can undo what time hath done? Who can win back the wind? Not an easy question to answer. Most of us acknowledge the idea that life is but a dream. We are not quite ready to accept the notion that time, too, may be nothing more than an illusion which is what our friend Ed Quaylen, professor of parapsychology, may or may not be about to discover. I'll return in a moment with Act Two. You want your house to be a home all year round. 
You can do it economically. No matter what the weather's like outside, you can train it so easily. So make summer a cool and thing. Turn winter into spring. It's the right time for carrier. Carrier's right for the times. The higher energy costs go, the more you need Carrier heat pump air conditioning. It cools your home in summer, heats it in winter for up to half the cost of electric heat and less than most oil systems. So before you replace your old furnace or put in air conditioning, talk to your Carrier dealer about heat pump air conditioning. He's the expert. So make summer a cooling thing, turn winter into spring. It's the right time for Carrier. children and adults push back the limitations of their handicaps. Helps them to enjoy the good life. Miracles still happen, and you make them. Easter Seals and you. Give to Easter Seals. Easter Seals and you. Give to Easter Seals. Easter Seals. For crippled children and adults. Easter Seals. The shadow on the dial, the striking of the clock, the running of the sand, day and night, summer and winter, months, years, centuries, these are only the outward signs, the measure of time. As for the nature of time itself, Professor Quaylen, who seems to have little more in common with Joe Delaney than his taste for good whiskey, is about to find out. The House of Representatives has just passed the measure by a vote of 211 to 105. It is expected that the new law... Well, uh, well, one moment, please. Please stand by for a special announcement. What's that all about? Shh, listen, it may be there's been a... Break. I am reading from a special announcement that's just been handed to me from the newsroom. The body of Charles A. Lindbergh, Jr., infant son of the great American hero, Charles A. Lindbergh was found dead less than an hour ago. Missing since March 1st of this year, a continued search for the child, dead or alive, had, up to this evening, revealed nothing. Turn it off, Luigi, please. In spite of the fact that $50,000 had been paid to the unknown kidnapper... What do you know? He paid the ransom and the kidnapper killed the kid anyway. It took two years to find the kidnapper. Two years? How would... In 1934. 1934? Yes. Bruno Hauptmann, a carpenter. He was brought to trial the next year in Flemington, New Jersey, I think it was, and found guilty of the crime. After that, they changed the law, the Lindbergh kidnapping law. Hold your horses, Ed. How do you know all this? What are you talking about? It was all in the papers. The Lindbergh kidnapping is part of history. Sure, but you're talking about 1934. Well, that's right, 1934. Ed, are you some kind... Luigi, mm -hmm. you happen to have today's paper? Or which one? The Mirror, the Journal American, the Herald Trip. I got them all. Any one of them. Hey, uh, Mr. Delaney. Thank you. Now, Ed, will you please read the date on this paper? Today's paper. May 1932. I've got a little headache. Going out for a breath of air. Let me go with you. You want to try that other place you spoke up, Joe? Casablanca, if it hasn't changed too much, I think you'll like it. Besides, I... The walk over there will do you good. Come yes, on. it might. It might indeed. I should have got rid of him right then and there and gone home. But there was something fascinating about the whole idea of going along with him. Something challenging. Anyway, minutes after we left Luigi's... 
And no hat, Joe? No overcoat? This time of the year? What I need a coat for? End of December. I make it the middle of May, Ed. A pleasant spring night with even a touch of summer in the air. Well, now what am I doing with this heavy coat? Muffler, fur-lined gloves. Take them off. Carry your coat on your arm. I don't understand it. You'll be all right, Ed. Uh, just what is it you said you teach? Parapsychology. Para what? Parapsychology. The part of psychology that examines and tries to explain phenomena like clairvoyance, telepathy, ESP. ESP? Extrasensory perception. Would that be something like, um, mind reading? Well, not exactly. There are people who can anticipate what's going on in someone else's mind days before the thing itself happens, even though the two of them are separated by hundreds of miles. Not fakes? Oh, definitely not fakes. I'll be a monkey's uncle. In fact, one of the things I've been working on is a new theory of time that says that past, present, and future are, in a sense, all one and the same. That a person, without changing in any way himself might be able to introduce himself into any period of time that he chooses. Well, how could that happen? Because time is not real. It's nothing but an idea that man has invented. All everything, Ed. Take a look at that. What is it? I told you I hadn't been here in almost a year. <laughs> I completely forgot. Forgot what? This is where the Casablanca used to be. Well, there's nothing here. A whole block's an excavation. Just one big hole in the ground. Read that sign up there. Buildings formerly at this location have been demolished in order to make room for what will be known as Rockefeller Center. On this site will be built one of the most beautiful and modern theaters in the world to be known as Radio City Music Hall. But Radio City was built over 40 years ago. What's that? The good old 6th Avenue L. They tore that down, the end of 1938. Take it easy, There Eddie. is no L. There hasn't been one in over 35 years. They tore it down and sold it for scrap. Professor, I think you need a little help. Maybe I do. But there's someone I have to tell about this. If what I think has happened has really happened, then I'm either the luckiest man in the world or the most miserable. I'm not sure which. Uh, taxi? Taxi! had the same dizzy feeling I'd had earlier in the evening. In fact, I'm almost certain that I blacked out right there in the cab. I can't be sure for how long. And then, before I knew what had happened, I was in Clovis Greenwich Village apartment. Clovis, darling, I apologize for what happened earlier this evening. Oh, I understand, Ed. You were more than a little wound up, and when that wine glass broke in your hand, you really lost control. I know, and I'm sorry. Oh, how is your hand? Oh, it's, it's all right. It's fine. Clovis, listen. You are the only person in the world who can understand what happened. What happened? Yes. You remember I kept talking about the days of prohibition, the speakeasies? Uh-huh. How I wished we could have gone back to one of them? So? Well, Clovis, that's where I've been. To a speakeasy? To a 1932 speakeasy. <laughs> what are you talking about? I have been back to 1932. I, I don't... Follow you. You know that imaginary helicopter I keep using in my lectures? Yes. Hovering over the earth as the earth revolves beneath it? Of course. And how I keep saying that almost any day now, someone who senses attuned to a fine sensitivity and who has the strength of will to want it to happen will make that helicopter land at almost any point in time that he wills. Yes? Clovis, I'm almost certain that I have done just that. I think I am that someone. What? Only I made one big mistake. I left too soon. I left Delaney standing there right under the 6th Avenue L in front of the excavation for Radio City Music Hall. Ed, stop pacing around the room. Sit down, please. Don't you see, Clovis, if I don't go back tonight? Look, I have to find Delaney again. It's, it's of the greatest importance. Why? Who, who is this Delaney? By himself, he's nothing. But meeting him again may be the answer to everything I've been searching for. Take me with you, Ed. I want to go with you. When the time is right, you'll come with me, Clovis. But not before. The night had become quite cold. There was a feeling of snow in the air. I pulled up my overcoat collar and started walking uptown. 
For a second or two, I had the same whirling feeling I'd had earlier in the evening. This time I knew what it meant. I felt strangely excited, exhilarated, impatient for the thing to happen. Now, if I could only get myself to land at that exact point in time that I was looking for... Hey, where you been keeping yourself all this time, Mr. Quaylen? Long time no see. Oh, I've been away, Luigi. Out of the country, I bet, huh? Oh, something like that. Must be a good year, year and a half. Long as that? Well, the night they discovered the Lindbergh baby, I remember you. You were here. That was uh, that was a year ago, last uh, May, wasn't it? Yes, I guess so. And here we are with another new year, practically knocking at the door. Nineteen thirty-four. Nineteen thirty-four. Yeah, well, at least one good thing after next week, prohibition will be repealed, and I can run an honest joint again. Luigi, you ever see that Mister Delaney, the Joe Delaney? The big advertising man? Yes. <laughs> it's one of my regulars. Usually turns up around this time of the night. At that point, I realized I had missed the exact point in time I had been aiming for. I'd overshot it by almost a year and a half. Instead of getting back to May 1932, I had landed into December 1933. I don't believe my eyes. My friend, the professor, right? Quigley, Quinn, something with a Q, correct? Quaylen. Ed Quaylen. Right, I'm Delaney. Yes, I remember. Joe Delaney. Advertising, account executive, right? What a memory. Where have you been keeping yourself all this time? Away. Can I buy you a drink? Why not? They didn't put you away, did they? <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Well, the last time you were here, the night we met, you were practically raving. Say some of the kookiest things. Like how they discovered the murderer of the Lindbergh baby. Well, here it is a year and a half later, and they still haven't found the guy. And then we walked over to 6th Avenue. You remember that? Very well. You kept giving out like some crazy mind reader how they were going to tear down the L, sell it for scrap. <laughs> Delaney, well, I see you got over it. Listen to me, Delaney. Listen carefully. Uh, you drinks, gentlemen? We have begun to populate the space around the Earth with man-made stars. We have begun to create new heavenly bodies that never were before. There is every indication that in the not-too-distant future, we may even be able to create or recreate the miracle of life itself. Well, what do you know? The biochemists are getting closer and closer to it every day. Do you follow me, Delaney? I'm not a very bright fellow, but I'm doing my best. In the same world where a man has walked on the moon. A man has walked on the moon. Did you hear that, Luigi? Where the entire notion of distance has yielded to the terrible onslaught of speed. Yes, Professor. In a world where distance and space have become almost meaningless, so has time. Delaney, believe it or not, I am living in the year 1976. And I have willed my way back more than 40 years to what you call now. You want to know something? You are a very sick man. Am I? You don't belong here. You belong in some kind of an asylum. You don't mind, Luigi. I'm taking my drink over to one of the tables. And if I were you, Luigi, I'd call an ambulance. Now, just what a this... minute. Take your crummy hands you off You ignorant little huckster. Luigi, he's getting a little violent. You better throw him out before he loses control. Completely. What do you think you're doing? Put that broken Don't you take down. another step toward me, Delaney. Not one step. You really are crazy. Just stay where you are. What do you think you're threatening? Go! Go! My God! Push that broken bottle into my bed! Hey, hey, you pushed Delaney over. He hit his head. He's out cold. And his face and head are all covered with blood. I didn't mean to. Well, maybe you better send for a doctor. Mr. Quaylen, you can't leave now. Don't try to follow me, any of you. Where are you going? Well, none of you will ever find me. Not if you were to live forever. The world-famous British philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, said some years ago... Heaven knows what seeming nonsense may not tomorrow be demonstrated truth. The miracle by which you now hear my voice began in the great mind and imagination of a man whose dream was, at the start, called childish and nonsensical. A wild dream called radio. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Moving on with the Allied spirit Going to a brand new town You 
watched a weaver at his trade, shuttles weaving faster and faster on the loom, creating a design where none has been before. And come to think of it, life's pattern is woven in just the same way, born of many different threads, meeting, merging, spinning out the small fabric of our existence. The March of Dimes is trying to create a better fabric of life, free from the tragedy of birth defects, a life which ensures every newborn the right to the most precious heritage of all, good health at birth. Medical service programs, scientific research, public education, all are part of the March of Dimes fight against this number one health problem for our nation's children. But a weaver, any weaver, needs help along the way. And birth defects are forever, unless you help. Help weave a tomorrow full of bright promise for our next generation. A tomorrow without handicaps at birth. Please, give to the March of Dimes. Thank you. The tree that is seen is real enough for the sensation of the eye. The tree that is dreamed of is equally real for the person who's dreaming of it, as long as the dream lasts. But the tree that is seen and the tree that is dreamed of can never be the tree itself, the real tree. In the same way, the experience of time can be an illusion something that's not quite real, something that exists in the mind alone. We join Professor Edwin Quaylen the following evening in the apartment of his young friend, Clovis Mason. Will you stop fidgeting while I change this dressing on your hand? Whew, that's quite a cut you gave yourself last night in the restaurant. Is the glass all out? I, I think so. Ed, after what happened that night in Luigi's place... That was when you took off for Nepal and the Himalayas? Mm. Inside of hours, I was on a freighter on my way out of the country. A couple of months later, I stumbled my way into that little village. Fifty, mm, sixty miles maybe, northwest of Kathmandu. Now, hold still. This may hurt. I... People took me in as if I were wanted. Ow! That does hurt. I'm sorry. Anyway, in the next twelve years or so, I learned whatever I now know about myself. And when you returned to the United States... 1946. I was a much wiser man. Sensitive to the disciplines of concentration, of self-will, of the need to conquer time and space. What about delay? In all these years, I've never been back to Luigi's. Not since that horrible night in 1934. Place is still there, of course. I know, but you're not answering my question. Delaney... I think I killed him, Clovis. That's why I ran away. I see. And the knowledge that I may be a murderer, a killer, has been haunting me all my life. And now that I, that I have this power to will myself back into the past the way I did tonight, I'm going to find out what really happened to Delaney. I understand. But you're not quite sure, is that it? Well, I intend to find out. I've got to find out about Delaney. Anything is possible. There, that does it. Now, try to keep the dressing clean. One question? Yes? When you go back this time... I expect to prove several things. For one, here in the year 1976, I am the respected Professor Edwin Quaylen, Ph.D. On another plateau of time, it, it could turn out that I have killed a man. And if I have... 
Are you expecting someone? No. Uh, who is it? It's me, Tuppy. I came to return that psychology paper I borrowed. I'll get rid of him real fast. Oh, boy, is it ever freezing outside. It's colder than... Oh, uh... Excuse me, Professor Quaylon. Uh, I didn't see you. Tubby. Uh, here's the paper, Clovis. I hope it helps. <laughs> it sure did. How's the team doing, Tubby? Well, so far, no complaints. Of course, a lot will depend on what happens tomorrow night. Oh, I'm sure of that. <sighs> Clovis, you can have a glass of water, please. Right away. Well, uh, what's wrong, Professor? Anything I can do? No, no, I'll, I'll be all right in a minute. Here, here, here's your water. Oh, thank you. What happened? I don't know. I... Just a second or two there, I, I just suddenly felt faint. Had a kind of buzzing in my head, a kind of high, whining sound. Everything about me started to vibrate. I'm all right now, though. Are you sure there's nothing I can do? No, no, thank you. Well, then, uh, guess I'll be going. I'm sorry about tomorrow night, Tubby. Uh, t tomorrow night? Yes, the game. What about the game? What are you sorry about? To lose such an important game by one measly little point. What? In just the last eight seconds of play. Uh, uh, I don't think I follow you, Professor. The uh, game, tomorrow night, 97 to 96, their favor. But, Ed, they won't be playing until tomorrow night, 24 hours from now. That's quite true, isn't it? Oh... Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah, if you'll excuse me, I, I think I have to be going. You sure you're okay, Professor? Yes, I think so, Tubby. 97 to 96? <laughs> that can't be. It just can't. This has been one of the most exciting games in the entire conference. The score has been seesawing back and forth all evening. With less than 15 seconds left, the home team is still leading by just a single point, 96 to 95. Oh, 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 oh. Red Summers has just got hold of the ball. We're ahead, Ed. I'm so glad you were wrong. He pivots. He passes it to Tubby Samartino. Tubby shoots. Oh, no. No, it just misses he the misses. basket. Tex Goldberg picks it up for the other team, dribbles it to the other side of the court with almost no interference. He shoots. And it's in. The score is 97 to 96, their favor. That's what you said. That wraps up the game. The home team has lost by a single heartbreaking point, 97 to 96. And with the conclusion of this... Ed. Yes? How did you know how tonight's game would turn out? I'm not altogether sure. It just sort of came to me. How? When? I guess it was when I... When I got that dizzy spell. Clovis. What is it? Clovis, could this possibly mean that I've actually done it? That I've gone ahead in time? You know how I've always said that imagination is the beginning of all creation. Lesson number one in your course. That you imagine, you conceive the thing you desire. That the next step is to will. To make happen the thing that you imagine. And in the end, to actually create what you will. Until last night, you thought you had succeeded only part of the way. Until last night, I wasn't 100% sure. I had been able, I am able, to will myself into the past. But last night, I think I completed the cycle. That, that silly basketball game was a kind of test. Test? Yes, I was up there for the briefest moment in that imaginary plane I keep talking about. And I looked down on everything. The past, the present... And the future. Exactly. I was there, Clovis, during those last eight seconds of the game. My body was here in this room, but I was also at that game. Tonight's game, 24 hours before they actually played it. I saw it all happen. And now what? They say a criminal always returns to the scene of his crime. Tonight, I'm going to try to go forward in time and visit the same place. What are you doing with that gun? I'm taking it with me. It may be needed. Oh, please, Ed, don't do anything foolish. I won't. I give you my solemn word. I left Clovis' apartment and started walking. I can't recall which way I was going. Toward the river, I think. Then, just as it had happened before, I heard that weird ringing in my ears. Everything got blurred before my eyes. The next thing I knew, I was sitting on a stool at the bar in Luigi's. Here you are, sir. Your drink. Thank you. 
Uh, bartender? Yes, sir. I'm curious about this place. Has it been here long? Luigi's? Mm. I thought everyone knew about Luigi. He's been here since the 1920s. That's all? Mm. Well, is there, uh... Was there ever an actual uh, Luigi? Oh, indeed there was, sir. Luigi was sort of an institution by himself. And he died only last year. That's his obituary up there over the bar. December 25, 1978. Great man. He died this past December... 1978? Mm -hmm. Christmas Day, three, four months ago. Sad day for all of us, for all his friends. Evening, Roger. A little windy tonight. Well, good evening, sir. The regular? Thank you. Mind if I sit here? Oh, no, I'll talk up so. Some wind out there tonight. You visiting our fair city? No, not really. I work here. That's so? Yes, I'm a teacher. College professor. Now, that is funny. The minute I sat down, I said to myself, I'll bet a dollar that gentleman's a college professor. <laughs> Does it stick out that much? Economics, I'll bet. No, no, not even close. Psychology. Psychology. Well, that's very interesting. You come here to Luigi's often? No, I haven't been here since... Oh, I can't remember when. Interesting history, this place. If these walls could talk. Yes, Yes, sir. This place has seen just about everyone and everything. U.S. presidents, foreign dignitaries, movie stars, murderers. Murderers? A man was killed right here at this same spot we're sitting at. Back in the 30s. A man was killed? Never found the fellow who did it. Disappeared that same night into thin air. One of the great unsolved mysteries of the police department. That's all. What, uh... What did the victim, this Delaney, actually die of? A fractured skull. You see, as he fell down... Excuse me, sir. Did you just say Delaney? Yes, the name of the man who was killed. How did you know his name was Delaney? Oh, you just said so. No, no, I did not. I mentioned no name. Well, that's funny. I thought you had. I guess maybe I had read about it at one time, and the name just stuck in my memory. Of course. By the way, what did you say your name was, Professor? Quaylen. Edwin Quaylen. I thought so. You thought so? Why? Do you know me? You have no idea how happy I am to meet you, Professor Quaylen. Wait a minute. What do you think you're doing? Putting handcuffs on you, Professor. You're under arrest. Are you out of your mind? Not quite. I'm a detective attached to the 17th Precinct. I've been looking for you for a long time, Professor. What's this all have to do with me? This is a double pleasure, a double satisfaction. Your drink, Mr. Delaney. Thank you, Roger. Delaney? Yes, I'm Vincent Delaney. You see, Professor, the man you killed, Joe Delaney, was my father. And that's why... Well, you'll never get me. Never. Wait a minute. What's happening? Where are you? No... No! Roger, have I gone out of my mind? Did you see what I saw? I, 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 I don't believe it. He vanished. He disintegrated right in front of our eyes. And the craziest thing, he took my handcuffs with him wherever he went. And if they think for one minute that I'm going to live out the next three years just waiting for them to catch up with me. Ed, what are you doing with that gun? Put it down. I will not spend the rest of my life in jail. Give me that gun, Ed. Oh. Go ahead. Open it, Clovis. Open it. I'm going into the bedroom. Oh, hi, Clovis. I was wondering if you and Professor Quaylen might like to be my guests. Guests? Yeah, yeah. At next Saturday night's game, I, uh... <laughs> I got two complimentary tickets to every game, you know. <gasps> Oh, dear Lord in heaven, no! According to the police, there's still no explanation for the fact that locked on to the right wrist of the body of Professor Edwin Quaylen was one half of a new type of police handcuff. The other half was dangling free. What puzzles the police authorities even more is the serial number of the handcuffs. The number QX. 152964 will belong to a new model that the police are contemplating purchasing at some time in the future. They do not anticipate that this new type of handcuff will be in production much before the end of 1978.
When Columbus, Magellan, the Phoenician navigators probed into the mysterious realms of the distant and the unknown, they hadn't the remotest idea that they were among the first to do away with distance and space. Once they were able to measure things, nothing was quite as immense as it was before. Nothing was too big to be firmly grasped by man's imagination. Even the idea of time. I'll return in a moment. Allstate asks, do you own a small business? Go over these questions with your present group health and life insurance agent. If your agent doesn't say yes to everyone, then... Talk to the good hands people. First question. Does your present major medical benefit keep on paying no matter how expensive the accident or illness becomes? If not... Talk to the good hands people. Is your present plan designed to pay up to 95% of hospital expenses? If not... Talk to the good hands people. You're in good hands with Allstate. See your Allstate agent to find out what an Allstate plan costs, what is and isn't covered, including benefit reductions and terms under which insurance continues in force. Allstate insurance companies, available in most states to businesses that qualify. Professor Quaylen, in his lecture, said that every period of time that ever was, is, or will be, is out there someplace waiting for us to put ourselves into it, if we wish. That some specially gifted person might one day penetrate the barrier of time and do what now seems impossible. Do you suppose that one of you, listening at this moment to my voice, might be the very one to do this? Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Rosemary Rice, Jackson Beck, Russell Horton, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. He could be a criminal genius, but don't let his running away convince you. All children do that when they're caught in a crisis. Stuart has run away, and we have got to find him. Just to find out, is he smart? No, Miss Telford, to find his friends. He's the only lead. Surely I don't have to explain. What would the Pentagon pay for a disintegration beam? How many millions would an element transmuter be worth? If we could teleport, travel by mind alone, how powerful would we be? My goodness. Mr. Herod, this professor's almost got me convinced. How about you? Mr. Warbeck, your caper makes us look like plankers. Thanks for letting us cut in on you. We'll pay off. We'll find that kid. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Allied Van Lines and Carrier Air Conditioning. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS News coming up next on KIXI. The weather outlook calls for considerable cloudiness through Wednesday with a few showers at times. Partial clearing tomorrow afternoon. The highs in the mid-50s and lows in the mid-40s. And in downtown Seattle, currently it's 50 degrees. At the airport, it's 46. 
The barometer rising at 29.81. Bright and beautiful music. This is KIXI, AM and FM, Seattle. The time at KIXI now, 11 o'clock. News. Tuesday is another presidential primary day. This time there are two primaries in Wisconsin and New York. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Most of the candidates were busy until the last moment looking for votes. Morris Udall spent part of Monday in both states. Late Monday in Milwaukee, he said he thinks he'll do well in Wisconsin. Our organization is simply superb in this state. I think out in the farming areas, uh and elsewhere, as well as in the university communities and the working-class neighborhoods, we've got organization. I think it's going to tell tomorrow. Udall has yet to win a primary. One of his rivals, Senator Henry Jackson, came out on top in only one of them so far, Massachusetts. But in New York Monday evening, Jackson says he's going to take that state's primary as well. We're going to win big because we've been talking sense to people. There's just one overriding issue, and that is jobs. Back to work, America. That is the issue. On the Republican side, neither candidate spent Monday campaigning for last-minute votes. President Ford was in Washington. Ronald Reagan went to Texas to open his campaign for that state's primary May 1st. More news in a moment. Are you an unpublished author? Do you have a book-length manuscript ready or almost ready for publication? Or do you know of anyone else who is an unpublished author? If so, Vantage Press invites you to write to a leading New York publisher for a free illustrated brochure titled To the Author in Search of a Publisher. It explains how you may have your manuscript printed and published in a matter of months. Just write to GPO Box 1414, New York, New York. Whether your subject is fiction, non-fiction, poetry, or even scientific, specialized, or controversial, this 52-page brochure shows you how to arrange for prompt publication. To get your copy, write to GPO Box 1414, New York, New York. That's GPO Box 1414, New York, New York. If this is your first book, you'll find this free brochure especially valuable and informative. Write to GPO Box 1414, New York, New York. GPO Box 1414, New York, New York. In Los Angeles, an attorney for Howard Hughes says the 70-year-old billionaire's death on Monday was caused by a stroke. Hughes died while being flown from his Acapulco home to Houston for medical tests. He apparently died just as the plane was preparing to land in Houston. Hughes was in later life a man who insisted on privacy and stayed well out of the public view. One thing that is known, he was very wealthy, worth perhaps as much as two billion dollars. His lawyer, Greg Botzner, was asked if he has any idea where all that money will go. I assume that uh, just as during his lifetime he devoted... Uh, all of his energies and uh, most of his wealth to uh, the benefit of uh, the uh, Hughes Medical uh, Institute that he would probably have left uh, his estate to the Hughes Medical Institute and or uh, further research and development uh, in the Hughes uh, uh, Aircraft Company which of course was devoted to research in, uh, in uh, space system and in aerodynamics. Bowser says details of Hughes' will are likely to be revealed probably in about 10 days in probate court in Los Angeles. The White House says there is no effort to try to get Secretary of State Kissinger to resign. The comment came after the president's campaign manager, Rogers Morton, was quoted as telling a group of California Republicans that Kissinger is getting toward the end of a long political career and may not go beyond next year. President Ford has signed a bill to open the Elks Hill Naval Petroleum Reserve in California for commercial drilling. The president says this is a very important step to reverse the decline in domestic oil production. Mr. Ford said Elk Hills will eventually yield about 300 barrels of 300,000 barrels of oil per day. Naval oil reserves were first established a half century ago to assure the US sufficient oil for its ships in wartime. But the administration notes the military already has first call on petroleum products in war under the Defense Protection Act. Labor troubles continue to grip San Francisco. School buses were halted Monday when most of the drivers refused to cross picket lines set up by city workers. About 15,000 children were left without rides to school. Now this. We're the fresh guns. We're the fresh guns. We're the fresh guns. We're wonder fresh. 
got that fresh, fresh feeling that makes a bread perform. Cause we're the Wonder Fresh Pot. We wrap while we're still warm. It's that fresh, fresh feeling that makes a sandwich store. Cause we're the Wonder Fresh Guys. Come squeeze us at your store. Feel the freshness of Wonder Bread. Enjoy fresh-tasting Wonder English muffins, too. I'm George Herman, CBS News. On Tuesday, the voters go to the polls in two important primary elections. New York, where the delegates are elected by registered party voters, and Wisconsin, an open election state where no party registration is required. Tuesday night, Neil Strausser and I will anchor the results, trends, and highlights of both primaries in special reports, regular newscasts, and net alert bulletins. Tuesday, follow the primaries with CBS News on this CBS Radio Network station. The Coast Guard has seized a Spanish fishing, fishing vessel 90 miles off the New Jersey coast for allegedly taking lobster from the continental shelf. The trawler was towed to Port Newark, where the captain is to be arraigned before federal authorities. U.S. law says lobster is a protected species and must be returned to the sea by foreign fishing vessels taking them from the continental shelf. Doug Poling, CBS News. CBS for Seattle, this is KIXI at 6 past 11. I'm Ben Franklin, and once again I quote from the wisdom of poor Richard's almanac, on doing a kindness. I once had a neighbor who had taken a dislike to me and never spoke to me. I sent him a note asking whether I could borrow a rare book he had. He sent me the book, I read it, and returned it with a note of thanks. When I met him a few days later, he spoke to me with great civility and offered to serve me on other occasions. It's a wise maxim. He who has once done you a kindness will be more than ready to do you another. And now, some wisdom from a modern source. Imagine a store where you can find just about every kind of insurance. A choice of leading insurance companies, low prices, and trained professionals. Imagine all this, and you've got the idea behind the insurance store. For your nearest insurance store, just see an agent listed under the Continental Insurance Soldier in the yellow pages. When President Thomas Jefferson purchased Louisiana in 1803, he also got Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, the Dakotas, and parts of Colorado, Wyoming, and Minnesota. At four cents an acre, it was quite a deal. Made possible by Americans investing in their country through U.S. savings bonds. Now it's your turn. Take stock in America. I'm Al Barron urging you to join the payroll savings plan where you work. It's a good investment.